presentations or different things after the fact. I'm going to pass this around if anybody wants to get more information. I am like a crazy anti-spammer, so feel, feel free to put it on there. I promise I will not uh, send you too much stuff. If anything, I get complaints for not blogging enough and that kind of thing. So how's everybody enjoying it so far? Awesome. Well, I'm Heather O. Uh, my name is Heather O'Sullivan, and usually people just get lost at the O. So, and uh, I discovered not too long ago that um, Heather O'Rourke from Poltergeist, although she's been dead for many, many years, is still very popular. So, I have a constant battle in my placement on Google with um, the Poltergeist girl. But anyway. Um, that's all just part of the process. Uh, first, I just wanted to kind of get a feel for, because we have a lot of different people here. So who wants to just shout out what they do? I know everybody's dying to. Huh? Web development. Web development. What else do we have in here? OK, thank you. Anybody else? Podcasting. Fabulous. Great. Very good. Anybody else? Don't everybody speak at once. Thank you. Awesome. awesome dad. Even better. <laughs> Even better. Well, and it's good to know because one of the things that we'll talk about is how different people come from a different place. You know, different people know different things and different people don't know different things. And so I will do my best to try and help you to figure out how to reach the people that you want to reach because the bottom line is is that if they need you, they don't think like you. That's why they need you. So I'm not a big PowerPoint girl. So there aren't a lot of slides here. Is it okay if we just kind of have a conversation? And I'll say what I have to say and then you guys ask questions and good. Um, so one of the places I want to start though is just a very brief history and don't want anybody having flashbacks of history class or anything like that, but just to kind of put a perspective on where we are today, uh, and for those of you who were in Berman's talk, he talked a little bit about the Industrial Revolution, and all that. although that seems like a million years ago, a lot of our culture still lives in that place. And so I think the biggest shift for all of us, no matter what we do, is realizing that we're moving into a different place now, and after the Industrial Revolution, the only people that had a voice were the people that had big bucks. You know, Ford could have a commercial on TV, and we didn't have a way to TiVo it or DVR it or whatever, so we kind of had to listen to it. And the beautiful thing about where we are now is that we have Google and others. That's the good news. The bad news is everybody else does too. So therein lies the challenge. So where you used to have, have this perception of having to kind of try and create a message that would speak to the most people because you were having to pay a gazillion dollars to be on primetime TV, you don't have to now. And in fact, the reality is, is if you do it that way, nobody will find you. I mean, there's a million places I can go get vanilla ice cream. There's only one place I can get Chunky Monkey. And I'm fairly certain there are enough people buying Chunky Monkey or Ben and Jerry's wouldn't keep making it. So and one of the things that I encourage you to do just for fun, um, because it does give you perspective, is go on Facebook and pretend like you're going to put an ad there, even if you're not, and just plug in within a five-mile radius or a 10-mile radius or whatever you want to, and just see how many people there are. It will blow your mind. I promise you it's more people you could possibly serve if you wanted to. And I think that that's a really big part of sort of stepping outside of our thinking because, again, we get caught up in this, like, I have to be all things to all people sort of scenario. And it's funny because uh, how many people here are on Twitter? Okay. Good, because I've tried telling the story to groups of people that aren't on Twitter, and it's really hard to explain. But anyway, on Twitter, they have tweet chats. And on Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock, they have a girls' night out tweet chat. And um, 
which is really fascinating, and you really can't do it unless you're using a, an application because there are usually about 2,000 women there. And the tweets just fly by so fast you have to have a way to pause them. But anyway, uh, somehow or another on this particular tweet chat, I mentioned that being a mommy blogger wasn't a niche. And if you could have been lynched through Twitter, <laughs> oh my gosh. But it's true. And I, you know, if I were to Google, if I were just looking for a mommy blogger and I were to plug that into Google, there'd be, I don't even know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of them. But if there was one in there that said, mommy blogger of two crazy girls, I'd click on it. I don't even have girls. Just because it stood out. And I think that that's really an important message, I think, for all of us to get is finding that line between this sort of feeling like I have to be all things to all people and realizing that you can't really help the people you want to serve if they can't find you. So, um, so we did the little history. That's a blank slide. <laughs> so now we're in a place where we're all connected. And I think it's, it's a great place to be, but it's overwhelming for a lot of people. And I think that the, uh, and that's why I said, I think it's really good to get a perspective on the fact that, um, you know, how many people there are in your local market, even if you don't necessarily just work for your local market. And, and so it requires us to think differently about the way that we market, but I think it's also really, really important to really focus on what our niche is and really know who needs us. Like I said, people who are like us don't need us. People that know what you know aren't gonna hire you. And that's a real challenge because we all speak different languages. In the sessions I've been sitting in today, I've heard a lot of different ways to say the stuff that I say, probably that's in a different, in a language that some of you would probably understand that I didn't even know before. You know, I don't, when the, the, the business owners that I work with don't, don't talk about user experience, but that's a terminology that makes sense to you. So I think that the question that you have to ask yourself, and I think it's worth writing down, is what are the people that I'm here to serve need and, and what are they looking for? Because the reality is, you know a whole lot of stuff. You know a lot of stuff I don't know. And if you told me all the stuff that you know, it would make my eyes glaze over and roll back in my head, and I'd say, nice to meet you, and I'd run away even though you could probably give me the very result that I want. And that's the thing is, what is the result? You know, most people don't really care about all of the steps that are in the process of building a website. They don't know Java from Fruity Pebbles. They just know what they want it to look like and what they want it to do. So how can you speak to them in a way that they can understand? And it's really not about being any different than who you are. It's just a matter of, you know, if, if I stood up here and spoke German, a lot of you wouldn't understand what I was saying. Right? So, and I think the key is when you really know kind of, when you really focus on what the result is that they want, then you can think about what they're looking for because people are gonna see what they're looking for and they're gonna tune out the rest. I mean, we get billions of inputs into our brain every day. We can't possibly process them all. And in fact, our brain is wired to weed out everything that's irrelevant. And a really good example of this is a, a client of mine gave this as a great example. She has a, a daughter who has some, some psychological issues and and so the example was if she was driving down the street and she heard a radio commercial that said, you know, Dr. Jane Doe is a pediatric and adolescent psychologist serving the greater triangle area, blah, 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 blah. She wouldn't hear it. But if she said Dr. Jane Doe specializes in children and teens with bipolar disorder, she'd be running off the road to get a pen and paper. That doesn't mean that Jane Doe can't have 10 different commercials, right? 
So it doesn't mean that you have to narrow yourself down to I only work with, you know, blonde headed, blue eyes, you know, five foot two males. But you have to be able to speak a language that they understand. And just men and women speak very different languages. Everybody in this room speaks in different terms. So that's one of the biggest secrets I think that's uh, that's important. And if and it's hard for us to unknow what we already know. Like you know what you know. So how do you how do you know how to talk to those people? And I would say, ask. If you already have clients, ask them. If I said this this way, would that make sense to you? What is it that you're looking for? I'm not saying that you ask people how to run your business. And Lord knows, don't ask your family what kind of business you should be in, because that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but feedback from the people that you're targeting is important. You have to take it with a grain of salt. I mean, if you try and run off and do everything that they tell you they need and want you to do, you'll never get anything done. But I think that's really, really important. How many people here know the difference between being left-brained and right-brained? Okay. How many people in this room are left-brained? Well, let me say for those who don't know. People who are left-brained tend to be more technically oriented, and people who are right-brained are more creative. So how many creative types do we have in the room? And how many are more technical? Awesome. Well, interestingly enough, um, yeah, well, and some people do go back and forth between the two better than others. But it's interesting, um, the, I just, I'm actually listening to this book for the third time, and I don't listen to any books three times, so that's saying a lot. But The Element by Sir Ken Robinson is an amazing book, and I highly recommend it. And uh, you can also, he does a, TED, a couple of TED Talks that you could find on YouTube. He's brilliant. But one of the things that he said that was really interesting to me was that they've done surveys that found when they asked five-year-olds if they were creative, 98% raised their hand. By the time they're in the seventh grade, it's 50%. And by the time they graduate from high school, it's less than 10 because in our culture, we're trained to believe that there's not a value in that. Yes. It's called The Element by Sir Ken Robinson. And uh, it's a brilliant book for a lot of other reasons, but it talks a lot about how people just have different natural gifts and talents, and there's some really interesting stories about, like Matt Fleetwood can't read a note of music. I just thought that was really interesting. So, so anyway, uh, but knowing the difference between being left brain and right, right brain and knowing that we can all, we all have both and we can all use both. It's just that some of us are more skilled in one or the other. And, and actually, as we grow up, our brain cells start to remap themselves based on what we are using and not using. So if you don't use it a lot, it's kind of like exercise. You don't use it, you lose it. And so one of the things that I do with clients is I make them carry a, well, I don't make them, but I tell them they have to carry a journal for 90 days and write their ideas down. And it's so funny because some people just do it naturally. Other people want to argue with me all day long. But I do everything on my computer. That's great, but you use a different side of your brain. Get a piece of paper and write it down. Start exercising that other side of your muscle. And it's amazing the different things that will come to you. And I mean, I'm, I'm an avid computer girl. I think I have, I think I'm up to like 67 notebooks in my Evernote. But I still write stuff in my notebook. And when you're stuck, that is the best way. Get out a piece of paper. I like Sharpie markers, whatever works for you. And, uh, and if you're not used to it, you'll get, it'll be hard to start with. But it's kind of like a floodgate thing. Once you get used to it, then, then it really will start to flow. And I think that that's a big part of the process in kind of discovering and figuring out, you know, look at the different types of clients that you've had already. What does the ideal client look like for you? If you could just pick the most perfect client you could possibly have, what do they look like? You know, you might do a word description, you might draw a stick person, whatever 
whatever works for you. But I have, uh, I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of the fly lady. Well, uh, I spoke at an event with the fly lady and, and was fortunate enough to become friends with her since then. But she has a very interesting story in that she was, many years ago, she was what people now would call a hoarder. And um, she married her second husband, and he was a little bit of a hoarder too. And he was a judge in their local area. And she lived in constant fear that somebody was going to come to their house because it was atrocious. And so, as a fact, she said it was funny because they had had a, um, a convict that escaped, and her husband was the judge that had put him away. And so they wanted to search the house before they went in to make sure that they weren't hiding there. And she said the police officer came out and said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is they're not here. The bad news is they trashed the place. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so many years ago, she decided she needed to get all that under control. And uh, she went to the library to use the computer and found a little online group. And anyway, one of the ladies there, her husband decided he didn't want cookies on his computer and she couldn't do it anymore. And so she created this little Yahoo group so that she could relay information to her. And now I think last check, she has 932,000 people in 104 countries in that group. She writes an article every day uh, for 238 syndicated publications and she, and she sends out well, six emails a day times 900,000, you do the math. But she said everything she writes, she writes to that one person. Now, clearly, the other not 899,000 people are not just like that one person. But she's very clear in her message. And I think that that's a really important thing to, uh, to keep in mind. Because when you try to speak to everybody, nobody can hear you. She's writing about how to basically how to get your house in order and yeah so and uh, she talks a lot about perfectionism and yeah my brain can't handle the six emails a day I do the digest for myself but um, but like I said we all have lots and lots of messages coming in every day and there are each and every one of you have different skill sets but then you also have different people that you connect with differently so there are some of you in here that may be really great at what you do, but we just wouldn't connect. Like, we just wouldn't dive. So think about who you really kind of jive with. And then if you have those people already, go to them and say, you know, if I said it this way, would that make sense to you? Uh, one of the things that I do with my groups, we have a private Facebook group where people can just put their mission statement in there and their marketing statements in there because they all do different things and get feedback from people. And it's amazing, some of them, like, I've gone through a six-week program with them and I know exactly what they do and I read the mission statement and don't know what they do. It's usually 13 sentences long and they lost me somewhere between the first and second word and basically the gist of what it says is I do everything for everybody. And I do a lot of speaking to realtors. I used to be one. And they're the worst. I sell everything from Fort Lauderdale to Seattle. Really? And it's funny because I had somebody recently asked me locally for a recommendation for somebody to help them with a short sale. And I probably have, I don't know, I haven't counted, several hundred friends on Facebook that are realtors in this local market. And there was only one that came to mind, and she's actually in Fort Lauderdale. Because at least once or twice a week, she posts an article on short sales. Now, I know that everybody I know has done one in this market, but nobody floated to the top but her. So I contacted her. She didn't know anybody in this market either. I said, wow. <laughs> and all of them are running around spending obscene amounts of money trying to get business. But people like me don't even know who to send to them. People like you probably don't know who to send people to. I joked last night at the dinner about how the, um, the title for this class was, had to have been bad because I couldn't remember it. 
to save my life. I kept having to ask Michael what it was called again, um, which is why I did the handout so that I'd make sure everybody got all seven points. Um, but what would have probably been a more effective title would have been Effective Marketing Tools Online and Off and What We Can Learn from the Grateful Dead and Steve Jobs. And hence the music when you came in. And I have to laugh because it never occurred to me that there would be anybody here that had never heard of the Grateful Dead, but I mentioned it to my 14-year-old last night and he said, who are they? <laughs> I said, alrighty then. So is there anybody here who's never heard of the Grateful Dead? You haven't? All right. Well, make a note to yourself to Google them later. Um, but there are a few really cool things that we can learn about them, whether you were a deadhead or not. And, you know, they were, some people would say, the most iconic band in history. And, of course, they were all pre-internet and everything else. But some of the things that they did that we can really learn from is they were very clear in who they were. And they weren't trying to be anybody else. You know, they didn't play country and jazz. And, you know, they didn't try to make music that everybody would like. They didn't try to look like or dress like anybody else. They knew exactly who they were. One of the things that they did that was very controversial at the time was they encouraged bootlegging. This was back when they had cassette tapes, for those of you who don't remember those. And I'm not going to get into the pros and cons of that, but what happened as a result of that is they shared the music freely with people that had never heard of them. They would make copies of their tapes, and other people would hear them, and then other people would like them, and they'd go buy more, and they'd go see their concerts. and. And they actually had a mailing list because, you know, mail with stamps on it was the only way to communicate with people back then. They had a mailing list of 40,000 people. And they mailed newsletters with stamps on them to their fans so they'd know what they were doing and where they were going to be. I mean, that sounds simple, but if you really think about that, how many businesses today... They have nothing but a website and they're whining that nobody's giving them money. I mean, really. So I think that's really something, and it's funny because when I talk about offline tools, uh, I'm actually a big fan of the handwritten note. I'm very much a computer girl, and it is more and more of a challenge these days because a lot of times you don't know people's actual address. Uh, although it's funny because my last year in real estate, which was five or six years ago, I can remember we'd always have people sign in when they'd come in to open houses for their model home, and they'd give you their physical address, but they wouldn't give you their email address for love or money, which I thought was really kind of funny, but it's because of spam. So most people, if you ask them for their physical address, don't mind giving it to you. They're usually pretty shocked, but, but I can remember... I had set a goal for myself to write 25 handwritten notes one week. So on Sunday morning, I was sitting down with 25 blank note cards because that five a day hadn't happened. So after I got through the first few, which were easy, it got a little harder. And so it was funny because I, I sent a note to this lawn maintenance guy that had come and saved me like six months before the day of my son's birthday party. My husband had thrown his back out, and so I called him up, and there was a hurricane coming. He's like, I don't know if we can get there. And I'm running around getting the birthday cake, and, and Chris calls and says, there's three strange men mowing our lawn. Do you know anything about this? And so anyway, so I sent the guy a note and just said, you know, I know it was a lot of trouble making it all work, but thank you and how much I appreciated it. And uh, and then this other woman who had had her house for sale by owner, who I didn't end up listing her house, but um, but I just sent her a note. This was several months later, and just thanked her for her time and how much how much I enjoyed just meeting her and talking to her. Well, the next two mornings, before eight o'clock in the morning, I got phone calls from both of those people. Going, that was so cool. I never get anything good in the mail. All I get is bills. Thank you so much. I never got direct business from either one of those people, but I got referrals from both of them. And it cost me a stamp and a note card. Which brings me to another point that I think is really important and as business owners. And, and I can remember in real estate, there was a, a 
guy that was a big trainer speaker and he used to always say in real estate everybody's a prospect and you stay on until they buy or die <laughs> okay well that didn't work real well for me but what I discovered accidentally was that everybody is a potential referrer and when you treat everybody as somebody that can potentially refer you business instead of stalking them like the potential customer it's amazing the shift that happens in you and in them it keeps you from feeling like you're gonna throw up and it keeps them from hating you so it's a win-win for everybody so so keep that in mind and 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 whether you're you know in, in the social space marketing is a very kind of nebulous thing and I think that the most important thing to remember is that while we all know what we do everybody else doesn't know exactly what we do and you're not going to show up on Facebook and post every day this is what I do send me business you could but you're not going to be anybody's friend for very long they're either going to unfriend you or hide you really really quickly so I think that the really important thing is as this particular agent did is just sharing valuable information consistently enough to where my brain connected her to what she did you know she wasn't constantly posting if you know anybody that need blah 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 send them my way now they do need to know what you do so you know that's kind of important so it needs to be somewhere on your page what you do and there again that's got to be clear if you just say if you have some long sentence that spells out the alphabet soup of what you do there are a lot of people that don't know what SQL is and the people that do probably don't need you to help them with it so I think that's really important I think that the recognizing that they have a different perspective from you sounds really simple but it's really hard to wrap your head around and um, and I'll give you an example can somebody on this side of the room tell me what you see can somebody on that side of the room tell me what you see you're both right you're both right so everybody has you don't have to have a pen if you have a um, short-term memory but I want everybody to look around the room and write down or commit to memory something in the room that's green okay now close your eyes tell me something in the room that you saw that was red because <laughs> you were all looking for green it's all still here but everybody's looking for what they're looking for and tuning out the rest and it's simple but when you think about I mean that plays out in so many other areas we don't even have time to talk about them all I promise you if you go into a target your kids see something totally different than what you see right and Lord knows if they go on YouTube they're gonna watch something totally different so but the seven fundamental secrets that I want to make sure that I cover for you is that people will buy from and refer to those that they know like and trust and one of the biggest things I get from people about Facebook or any any of the platforms that are online is I just don't get it I go on there people are talking about what they had for breakfast I don't really care and it says we were talking about books earlier and I meant to bring mine but if the go-giver by Bob Berg B-U-R-G is very short you don't even have to buy it you could just read it in the coffee shop at Barnes and Noble um, and it's not about social media really but if you applied the five laws of the go-giver in your business and in social media that would be all you would ever need to learn because people do they buy from the people that they know like and trust and 
uh, and ironically, thanks to Twitter, I've become good friends with Bob Berg, the author, because I talk about the book a lot. And he was a sales guy for many years and still trained salespeople. And he told a great story uh, about this guy that he met in a networking event. And he said, well, uh, so that I can help you, Jim, or whatever his name was, what are you looking for? You know, if I come across somebody, how will I know if it's somebody that can help you? What do you need right now? And he said, well, actually, what I really need is a job for my daughter. She's graduating from college. <laughs> and this is what her degree is in and what she's doing and so forth. And so a couple days later, Bob thought of somebody that might be a good contact for her. So he contacted him, and then he contacted Jim. And she interviewed for the job. She didn't end up getting the job. And Bob never got any business from him right away. But over the next two years, he did $2.6 million in business through that connection. It had nothing to do with how great a sales trainer he was. Know who you're talking to. Understand their language and be where they are in the platforms that they are. And that's a really big thing. I actually tried to put together a young entrepreneur seminar a couple of years ago. And I had a killer panel of speakers, had the location, had everything, had a gazillion people on Twitter that thought it was a great idea. The problem was at that time there was a very low percentage of teenagers on Twitter. And guess what teenagers aren't real jiggy about doing? What their mom and their grandma think they need to do. So while mom and grandma thought it was a great idea, only one signed up, and that was the one 13-year-old that was on Twitter. So, uh, so I think that that's really important to be where they are and to give value. Show them what you do and what you're good at. Don't just try and tell them. I mean, there are people that I freely admit I've hidden from my Facebook stream because the only time they show up is when they have their latest jewelry to sell. I mean, I, you know, I can watch TV for commercials. And in fact, most people that watch TV don't even watch them anymore. But the beautiful thing about the space that we live in now is if I don't know somebody that does what I need, I can find somebody who does. I'm not going to the yellow pages. Does anybody even have their yellow pages? <laughs> When I used to have an office in downtown Apex, it was funny because they'd come around and they would deliver all the yellow pages and then they'd all be, like that afternoon, they'd all be in a pile next to the trash can. So when I need something, I go to Twitter or I go to Facebook. And I can tell you that um, at some point, Lord willing, in the next year I'm going to buy a car. And there's a guy in Winston-Salem that owns a used car dealership named Tracy Meyer, and that's where I will go. I won't shop anywhere else. And I'm so thankful I don't have to. <laughs> so, because the last time I went shopping for a car, I ended up buying it from the 10th place I went. Because the first nine just didn't listen. I mean, the, I, I was very clear. I used to be in sales. I'm a girl. Don't show me what's under the hood. I don't care. I've already done my research. I know what kind of engine it has. I just want to see it. Very first guy pops the hood. And then the really funny part was the engine was smoking. <laughs> he was trying to tell me that it was just steam coming off the engine. <laughs> so thank you. Have a nice day. So, but really know what your passion is and choose your niche. And I can tell you, and uh, angels can attest to this. I won't make you speak, but I do a lot of virtual coaching groups. And the hardest thing in the world is to get the folks in those groups to choose a niche. It is really hard. So what I started doing was telling them they had to pick one for 90 days. And it's funny because when I did my first group, there was one woman in the group who was a photographer in Australia. And what she really, really loved was nature photography, but she was taking pictures of kids and pets because she was convinced that was the only thing people would pay for. So finally, after about the fifth session, I'm 
if I remember correctly, I think she was in tears. She agreed to just do nature photography for 90 days. The next day, she was contacted to do two weddings. She'd never even tried to do a wedding, but they were outdoor weddings. And it's funny because I couldn't have planned that. And to this day, and I've done many, many groups since then, it's funny because somehow the universe just lines up to affirm that decision in one way or another. And it's always in different ways, and they nev you never see it coming. You can never predict it. So think about it. Think about what niche you would enjoy working with the most. And just commit to it for 90 days. Doesn't mean you don't do anything else. Doesn't mean you can't talk to anybody else. And I promise you, you will get more people that aren't in that group than ever contacted you before because, again, it's like the mommy blogger. People can hear you. And it's funny because, uh, you know, most people know who Steve Jobs is. And I have a friend who is a consultant out in California, and she did work with Apple. And, and she said it was interesting because she said she was sitting in this upper-level um, business meeting one time with him and the rest of the team. And so they're having this really intensive conversation. And I said Steve happened to glance out the window, and he got up and he left the room. And everybody was just sitting there like, what just happened? And they look out the window, and he's out on the sidewalk talking to a kid that was walking by. He happened to notice the kid walking by had an iPod, and he just wanted to see what his thoughts were about it. Very simple. And the thing that I thought was really interesting was their primary focus, you know, most people think of Apple products as just being really cool. They said, yeah, their fundamental mission was always simply ease of use. The fact that they were just really cool happened to be a byproduct, but their sole focus was on ease of use. For those of you who remember when the first iPhone came out, every other phone manufacturer was trying to figure out how to cram more features into a $90 phone. And then here they come along with a $500 phone. And I remember, I didn't, wasn't there to buy one, but I remember seeing the lines wrapped around Best Buy. And now, there are just a few more people with an iPhone than the early adopters, wouldn't you think? Just saying. I mean, the only thing my 12-year-old wants for Christmas is an iPhone. He's 12. <laughs> really? So, having said that, I want to give everybody a chance to ask questions, and because I could just talk forever. But yes. Certainly. Well, I would think about what things your ideal client would be interested in. Blog about it. Post other articles about it. You don't always have to be the one to write it. Um, I mean, I do good to do a blog post a week. But I do spend about 10 minutes every morning going through Twitter, finding articles that are relevant. I open all those windows. I quickly scan through them, see which ones are relevant. If I don't have time to read them right then, I put them in one of those Evernote notebooks. And, and then I also keep an Evernote notebook on things to blog about, because you know when you're driving and in the shower, you think of those things, and then when you go to sit down to do it, you're like, crap. So I have more topics and resources there than I could ever possibly write about. So I encourage you to look for information that is relevant, maybe not directly to your product, but that would be useful to your client or your prospect. And, and that could be a lot of different things. You know, it may not necessarily be what you do, but, you know, for example, if, you know, your, your market was the mommy market, well, there are 
you know, there's lots of different articles that are published every day that appeal to those people. And so as a result, you are showing and not telling them that you are an expert in whatever that arena is, you know, that you're on top of things. Um, and it's funny because it doesn't take long for that to happen. Sometimes it happens when you don't even mean to. I discovered that a couple years ago. Suddenly I was Facebook girl. And I'm like, no, no, really, that's not what, what I do. <laughs> but I was fascinated by the growth of it and the power of it. And so, um, you know, sometimes um, there's a Gaelic saying that my grandmother used to have hanging in her bathroom. And it says, God grant me the gift of ghee, the ability to see myself as others see me. And I don't think we ever really can. But I think if you at least know how you want people to see you, you got a much better sh shot at it than any other way. And I think at the end of the day, just there's tremendous power in being you. Now, I will say that if you don't like you, fix whatever it is about you that you need to fix. But sometimes that's what will just make you float to the top. There, one of my favorite bloggers is, um, and I can never say her last name properly, Erica Napolitano, redheadwriting.com. Her language is god awful, and I really have to think long and hard sometimes before I post it on Facebook, but she's brilliant. Absolutely. She doesn't censor herself for the people who don't like the F-bomb. And she has like 60,000 people that follow her blog. Now, there's a few more million people on the planet that don't, but, you know, do you need more than 60,000? Not really. And she doesn't have to get up in the morning and figure out, okay, so if I say it this way, then I'm going to offend these people, and if I say it that way, then those people aren't going to like, no. And um, it's funny because I have, um, I, I don't consider myself an artist per se, but in the traditional sense, but I do have one product on Zazzle.com, and it's a t-shirt that says unapologetically imperfect. <laughs> and I own that. And, but what I found is people don't want perfect. People don't relate to perfect. I mean, people want to, I mean, if they're hiring, you know, a surgeon, they want to know that he's a good surgeon. <laughs> but, you know, there are a lot of people out there, and, and one of the things that I caution people when, that I work with, especially on Twitter, is, you know, be careful following all the people that do what you aspire to do. Because when you start following all these people up here, then it's really easy to start feeling like this. Follow a few, get some ideas, but recognize that not everybody wants that person. Sometimes people want somebody that's right here, just a little bit above them. And it's funny because I used to do, um, well, now I have an Evo phone, and apparently the quality of the camera is now so good that I can't upload anything. But, um, but I used to do um, mobile videos because I didn't like doing videos. And I thought, well, if I'm in my car and I don't have to worry about my hair being perfect, the light being perfect, and everything else being perfect. And it's funny because for some reason I uploaded one one time and it uploaded sideways. And I started to take it down and I was like, you know, I'm not. I'm just going just to prove the point that it wasn't perfect and it was okay. I got more comments on that stupid video than anything else I ever did. And some of them were really funny, like, you know, it was a great video. I have a crick in my neck, but thank you anyway. Um, but there were so many people that just, just, I can't, of course, now I'm drawing a blank on comments, but they just said, that is just so cool. I always get caught up on da 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 da, -da because, yeah, well, that's kind of the whole idea. Everybody has a bad day. Everybody else has a bad hair day. I mean, and you talk about videos, it's funny because I spent six months trying to do the first video I was ever going to do on YouTube. I don't even remember what it was supposed to be about, but it never happened. But a few years ago, we um, rescued a litter of seven puppies that I came across this Craigslist ad. And 
Anyway, so we adopt these seven puppies an hour before they were to be executed at the shelter. And um, they were all in a little pile on top of this huge bowl of regular dog food. These puppies were so little we had to syringe feed them for a week. So it was a wonder they even survived. But needless to say, if you've ever had a newborn, multiply that times seven, because they had to eat every two hours. And so this one particular morning, I got up and I stepped in puppy poop. And I did like everybody else would do. I took my shoe outside and cleaned it off. And I realized later that day that it was like I was still carrying the poop around on my shoe. I was still cranky and stompy and tired. And so my first video was, did you step in poop today? And I'm sure it's still on YouTube. Um, but, but everybody could relate to that. And it wasn't perfect. And all the time that I wasted and all the attempts previously didn't really matter. Because that day I was determined to do the poop video, which my boys still think is really funny that their mom was on YouTube talking about poop. Um, but that's, that's what makes it real. You know, sometimes when you get up and your hair is sideways, there are other people that got up with their hair sideways too. And it just might make their day that you posted a picture on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And that is where the connection comes from. And that's the big difference between where we are now and where we were then, is that now people have the ability to connect with you and pick you or refer to you because they like you and they trust you. But the only way to do that is to show up and actually give something. And sometimes giving value isn't hard. There are people who get, on, get up in the morning and just type good morning on Facebook and Twitter. Say good morning back. You don't even have to have a cup of coffee to be able to follow that train of thought. I mean, you really don't. But it makes a difference. You know, when people take the time to upload a picture of their little kid, comment, cute kid, if they are, or looks like fun, if they're not, or whatever. It doesn't have to be brilliant, but I promise you it will create the energy in that space where then people will start to notice you and pay more attention to you and have more interest in what you do, and then you build on that from there. Any more questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have other web designers and web developers who buy from us for their clients, mm -hmm. and then we have the direct clients who are mm -hmm. straight to it. Their, their language, what they want, is completely different, but they have one product. So what's your advice with that, to develop completely separate pages on the website? Mm -hmm. to kind of do yes. Okay. Yeah, and then you can, and in other places you can, um, like for the, um, for the end user that's, more of your commercial market, you know, create a group on Facebook for those people and post relevant information and articles about Joomla that would be beneficial to all those people, whether it's necessarily yours or not. Um, I have a group on Facebook for women in real estate. I don't sell real estate anymore. But as I come across good articles, I put them there you know, um, so, and then you could do, you know, people, the, the consumer that doesn't know you yet, obviously, is not going to be joining your group? But if you have people that are longtime customers, create a group for them as well. Because, you know, then they're, they, they're privy to your information. And I don't know about the rest of you, but email isn't the way to reach me anymore. I mean, I check my email, but the, the way I process my email, I have all my email funnel through Gmail because they have a better spam filter than I can find anywhere else. And when I get up in the morning, there's about 132. And I go through and I star the ones that I want to read, and then I click all, unstar, delete. Because it's the only way to get through it all. I'd never leave the house if I tried to read them all. And again, but that depends on your market. I mean, there are certain people that are in the older markets 
uh, they wouldn't delete an email. Like they read every one, including, you know, the send $10,000 to South Africa for my bail. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, they'll read it all. But the rest of the world doesn't. Not, and my, my kids, 12 and 14, oh, I could email them all day long. If I don't message them on Facebook, forget it. So, again, that's knowing your audience and knowing your market. And, um, and knowing different personality types, too, especially when, if you're doing, like, on your website. There are bullet point people. And you need to have places for those different types of people if, you know, if that's who you're serving. I mean, I'm a bullet point girl. A three-page dissertation, I'm not going to read. But there are people that will. They want to know about your kids and your dog and what you had for breakfast. And um, so they're all different. But you never know, you know, who's out there. And one thing that, um, that I have to throw in there because I, I just thought it was really cool. I got a call the other day from this 83-year-old woman in Seattle. She and her husband uh, do a, they have a radio station and their website is jimfrenchproductions.com. Anyway, they do, um, they're basically actors and they do radio versions of all these different plays. And they're actually the only people that are allowed to do Sherlock Holmes. Which I thought was really interesting. Um, but, and it's so funny because she can't email me because she doesn't use email. And, and it was so funny because I'm talking to her about Facebook and Twitter and different things. And her husband saying, well, I'll send all that to my webmaster. And I'm like, okay. Um, but the thing that I thought was really interesting was in 1956, she worked in a retail store. And Jimmy Stewart came in. Does anybody know who Jimmy Stewart is? Okay. It's a wonderful life. And she was a budding actress at the time. And he gave her a few tips. And I was trying to write them down while I was driving. I couldn't write them all down. But the one thing that I do remember that she said that he told her was, get clear on who you are and learn to love yourself, and then everybody else can love you. But it won't ever happen before then. And I thought that was kind of cool. Do you have a question? <laughs> you kind of had that questioning look on your face. OK. Any more questions? Well, I don't remember whether I put it on the flyer, but for those of you who are on Twitter, I'm Heather O on Twitter. On Facebook, I'm real Heather O because that other Heather O got to the land grab before I did. But And my website's heatherow.com. And uh, I do have an um, online training coming up, so if anybody's interested in that, that should be on your flyer.